Welcome to From Jesus to Judaism, where former Christians share how they found the one true God. Now here's your host, Annie Hunt. Hey, Annie here. I'd like to welcome you to today's podcast, and boy, do we have a guest that you are going to love. His name is Steve Eisenhower, and he is host of the popular YouTube channel, The Exodus Project. Steve's going to talk to us today about how he came out of Christianity and found the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a fascinating story because Steve was really, really steeped in the Christian faith in many ways, and he's going to tell you about that. But the fact that he found this truth on his own is really nothing short of a miracle. So let's get started and welcome Steve to the show. Hey, Steve, good to have you on the show today. Hey, thanks for having me on. It is my pleasure for sure. And I know you have an incredible story about how you woke up to the truth about the one true God and how you came out of the Christian faith and totally left it all behind. So I just wanted to start by asking you some of the basics. What was your background? What did you do before you realized these truths? And how did how did your life progress to where it is now? <laughs> uh, how much time do we have? Um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so initially, I was raised in a Pentecostal church. Um, my grandparents were, my grandparents were actually brought up Lutheran, became Pentecostal as adults. And so I was like third generation, I guess you could say. Um, as I, as I aged, I, I felt like I was called to the ministry. Um, so that was probably at the age of 14. I started feeling that way. Um, so I, I started studying, started making, you know, lessons and, you know, sermons, that type of stuff as, as a kid, you know, and, and the, Normally, like the preachers, the the pastors or whatever, are normally very excited about that type of thing, you know, like a <clears throat> to have like a mentee, you know. So, you know, I was going along with that, um, and then in my twenties, I I got a youth pastor position. Uh, I was doing, I was the co-host on a Christian radio show. <clears throat> I was doing seminars. I was doing like evangelistic work, like preaching, so on and so forth. So I was pretty deep into it. I was, I was a, a minister with multiple hats, you could say, doing doing all sorts of things, leading leading what they called life group, which was basically like your midweek service, but we had them in homes. I don't know if you're ever, if you're familiar with anything like that. Um, so I was leading that. Um, I was also, I was also the, I was teaching, man, this is a pretty crazy resume. I was, I was teaching, uh, it was called like revival by design. It was basically like discipleship classes on Sunday evenings, uh, leading the prayer services for the church, you know, just pretty much everything musician for my, like I played the saxophone since I'm nine. So when I was, uh, so I was always in the, in the church's worship team everything you know and as i as i moved into that ministry role i started taking college cl courses in christian apologetics um i was writing a devotional and i was working with working with a friend of mine we were working on uh the devotional i was writing a chapter of that it was a 90 day devotional and each day he basically posted each day in a newsletter for his company he had. He he had a, a Christian-based archaeology, like biblical archaeology company. So the opening letter was like the opening page of that, of his little newsletter that got sent out every every week was just my little devotional. Um, so I was doing all sorts of things, all sorts of things. And as I'm moving into this um, study of apologetics, of course, you're you're having to take courses and and start learning how to build defenses because that's what apologetics is: is defending your faith. Uh, and one day, my friend, we were having a chat, 
and I could tell something was off about him. And we were just discussing something. And he next thing he goes, why don't you try to refute this? And I said, okay, what is it? And he sent a video. And I didn't recognize the name. And it said, um, Rabbi Tovia Singer debunks the virgin birth or, or something to that effect. Uh, and I'm like, oh, too easy, you know? So I take this home and I start just analyzing it, trying to build a case on how I'm going to basically debunk this, you know? And I had no answer. And that disturbed me, you know, it disturbed me to my core. So I started watching more and more of his videos to try and find almost like a plot hole, you know, try to find a hole that I could, couldn't find one. And what initially started out as me trying to f figure out a way to, you know, refute Tovia Singer and his, and his um, presentations of the New Testament in light of the Tanakh and how it's incompatible, it just led me down this path that I continued to study even more. I began to teach myself Hebrew, all these different things, and here we are. But one one thing I can say is during that during that initial phase of listening to Tovia and studying, man, I probably cried for a week straight. Honest to God, um. It, it wrenched me to my core because I, I felt like I was lied to for my entire life. It felt like, you know, just 25, 26 years down the drain for absolutely nothing. How could my family lie to me? How could these people I confided in lie to me? You know, that's really how I felt. And, you know, I was I was broken, really. So it really took Hashem and the willingness to want the truth rather than rather than, um, you know, religion, you know. And another main factor was when I was in that leadership role, we had we had what we called the fivefold ministry from Ephesians four, you know, pastors, evangelists, apostles, prophets, and teachers. I'm sure you're familiar with the verse. Yeah. Uh, so I was the in-home evangelist and youth pastor. We had a pastor. We had someone who was labeled as a prophet. The bishop was called the apostle. And there was a teacher who basically like oversaw everything else. We took turns preaching every Sunday, so on and so forth. I was the youngest in that group by at least 10 years, and I was the one that every other minister went to for biblical clarity or biblical advice because I just studied more than them, you know? And I'm not trying to say that to be haughty or say they're stupid, but it's true. I mean, I, I have my own business, so I could split time pretty easily between being in my shop and being in my office studying and compiling my notes and all these different things. So I would go to the the elders with questions, and the only answer I ever got was, well, that's just not for us to know. That's the divine mystery. And, you know, it just wasn't an answer for me. And as, as I was now deep into, um, you know, watching Tovia's videos and so on, I just started asking rabbis these same questions, and they had answers. And I was like, wow, so this is what this is like? <laughs> You know, and um, yeah, a uh, couple years later after that, here we are. I started Exodus Project and been chugging along ever since. I think it's a compelling story on several fronts, but the first one <laughs> being that you saw the truth on your own. Because a lot of people don't always just see it. It takes a lot of doing to get them to understand what's going mm -hmm. on. But the fact that here you are trying to debunk the virgin birth story and somehow the light bulb goes on. I do believe you told you said you came from the Pentecostal movement also. Um, theologically, was was your background Trinitarian or oneness, oneness Pentecostal? Pretty much Trinitarian. Okay, so like Assemblies of God. Okay, well, right, I was from exactly. the I was from the United Pentecostal Church, which is basically modalist. You know, Jesus only, no distinction between anything. You know, so I really think, for example, I when I was when I was a kid, I could have quoted you the Shema like that, because that was like our foundational verse. If you're going to be a modalist, there can only be one God, right? So, I knew the Shema like the back of my hand. Hero Israel, the Lord our God is the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Um, and that was like foundational for us because we were always arguing with Trinitarians. So one of the big 
Oh man. One of the biggest questions I had was Jesus praying in Gethsemane in the book of John. Um, it just never sat well with me ever. And I used to think, man, am I just stupid that I don't get it? You know, because it never sat well with me. Like, Who's this guy praying to if he's him? Like, at least the Trinitarians have something they can bank upon. You know, modalists couldn't, you know, a, a oneness Pentecostal couldn't. It, like, is is this all just scripted? <laughs> it's kind of like how I felt, you know. And I would go to these ministers and be like, man, this doesn't make sense. You know, the, the more I read this, it just doesn't make sense. The way we present our theology, it doesn't make sense. And they're like, no, no, you just have to have faith. You know, you're letting the outside, you're letting the Trinitarians get to you. You're letting the outside world get to you. And then, you know, of course, I found Rabbi Singer. I found Judaism. I found I found how they present God as one, right? Ein Sof, you know, and clicked. You know, you don't need this 100% man, 100% God trash, you know, and on top of that, as as I was going through the Torah, because I'm sure you can attest, most Christians, they just don't read it. Right. You know, they read they read the first few chapters of Genesis. They breeze over it to get the basic idea. A little bit of Exodus. They know the plagues and they know, you know, leaving Egypt. But Numbers and Leviticus, give me a break. They've never read that, you know. <laughs> so as I'm going through Numbers... And I get to the chap chapter 23, verse 19, and I'm like, hmm, because it was like a formula, you know? Mm -hmm. It starts out, God is not a man. And I was like, okay, well, you know, that's, that's suspicious that he can lie, right? Okay, that's just saying God's not a liar. And then it hops into, nor is he the son of man, that he must repent. And as soon as I read that, it was, it was, and I, I've read it a thousand times before, I'm sure, and just, you know, just glazed over it, didn't even care. But this time something jumped out about it because instantly my brain went to Jesus' baptism, right? Because everyone knows that John baptized with the baptism of repentance. Therefore, when Jesus was baptized, he, as the Son of Man, as he refers to himself as over 80 times in the New Testament, just had the baptism of repentance. He's the Son of God isn't the son of man. God doesn't need to repent. And I'm sitting there thinking about that. And if, if this is real, then God became a man, therefore making himself a liar. And I was, and it was like Numbers 23, 19, in this new light of Jesus' baptism for me, blew my mind away. You know, it was just like something I was just sitting at my desk going over this. And all of a sudden, like my brains are on the wall. You know what I mean? Like I just had no... You know, and, and I'm like, whoa, how did I just never put this together? You know, that God do, even doing that makes him a liar. Therefore, it must be false. And <laughs> I have to reject it. And, you know, there it was multiple aha moments like that that really got me to the point where I said, you know what? I got to wash my mind of this stuff and I have to start learning from some more reliable sources. Yeah, it. It's one of those things, once you do open your eyes and see it, you can't unsee it. it. Sure. It just makes so much sense. And you say, wait a second. If I knew this before I was told the New Testament stuff, I would have never bought into the New Testament. Right. And I can attest, because I told people to do it, that when a new convert is made, Christians, they're, you know, when I was a Christian, we would say, start with start with the Gospels. If you want to if you want to know what the Bible's about, start with the Gospels and then go back and read it. I can tell you from personal experience as a Christian minister, that's how we approached things. So you're defeated from the get right out the gate because now you already have it in your mind. Okay, Jesus is the Messiah, you're gonna die for my sins, so on and so forth. He's part of the Godhead, etc. Now you're going back and you're reading everything with those Christian glasses, as it were. You know? Yeah. And that's one thing that I saw right away. I thought I need to really sort of forget about everything that I was told in the Christian faith and read this just yeah. like I was starting from scratch, because mm -hmm. then I'm not putting any kind of ideas into it. 
because what they what Christianity does is it just keeps inserting their own ideas here mm -hmm. in this book that has nothing to do <laughs> with what they're saying it has to do with. And I think that you noticing this whole, you know, fallacy about the virgin birth was so insightful of you because that just goes over people's heads. And even when you explain to them that the word there that is being used is Alma, not Batula, which means virgin, it still isn't connecting with them because they've been so brainwashed to think yeah. that it's a virgin. You know, and I, I can honestly say that wasn't even really what did it for me. I could have lived with that. I could have, I could have accepted, okay, maybe it's just a young woman who just so happenly, ha you know, just who happens to be a virgin, you know, that part I could have lived with, but studying Isaiah seven in context is really what proved it to me because mm -hmm. I'm like, why would, what, you know, clearly Isaiah is talking to Ahaz and the chapter is painting Ahaz to not be that great of a guy. And I'm just thinking, why would Ahaz give a hoot about someone who's going to be born 700 years from now? Like Ahaz isn't worried about that kind of stuff. Ahaz is worried about the fact that there's two kings knocking on his doorstep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and I'm, I remember having a conversation with my grandmother. I was living with my grandparents at the time. I was uh, not long before I was going to be getting married. I remember sitting at my grandmother's kitchen table and we're talking about this. And I said the same thing. I'm like, Grandma, read this. You know, read it. it like, this isn't a virgin birth. This is this is Isaiah simply saying, you know, every time you see this kid, you're going to be reminded, hey, it's going to be OK. And I just remember my grandmother's eyes. It's almost like her face dropped and her eyes got real wide. And she looks at me and she's like, oh, wow. And then the conversation persisted. And then the next response is, but Jesus is God. And I'm like, come on. OK, but like, <laughs> Then, then you can't rely on the, on this book to prove yours, you know? My fiancé, Jim, told me this saying when I first met him, and he repeats it a lot because he was in the network marketing world. Mm -hmm. And so that's a lot of sales. And But there was a saying that was very popular, and it says, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Sure. And this very applies very good point. so well to what you're saying here she was convinced and no matter what nothing was going to change her mind even yep. if you could present her with all the evidence <laughs> she yep. she was convinced of something completely different so therefore she exactly. was unable to see the truth yeah and you know lifelong not lifelong but most of her life as a pentecostal you know she's had that upper room experience as they call it you know she's spoken in tongues and experienced all those different things and i understand it's it's hard to let a euphoric spiritual experience go you know especially when you feel like wow this is really the truth you know it's i can understand yes and what they don't understand about these euphoric experiences is it is all energy sure i went to a benny hinn crusade Oh, no, please. One, I need to hear three. about this. I okay. need to hear about this. This was incredible. And talk about energy. So there was, I don't know, there was thousands of people there. And I know a lot of them spent the night before trying to make sure they got a seat and everything. And I was up in the nosebleed section. And the room was just thick with this energy. And I'm sure some people thought it was the Holy Spirit or whatever. But it was just the energy of all these like-minded people going there for the same purpose, right? The yeah. intention of the whole crowd was the same. So it creates this energy field. And then, of course, Benny is the walking embodiment of their intention. Sure. So this is the brain doing all this, right? creating mm -hmm. the scenario. Yep. So he, he comes out and they're playing the mu music and it's all dramatic and everything. And he had the, <laughs> he had the choir behind him. And anyway, he comes out on the stage and he was, he went yeah, like that. And he like <laughs> threw his hands across the room. And I swear to you, all of us fell. We all fell. And I couldn't even believe it, right? So I realized the power of collective energy and, sure. and collective intention. 
So even when you're just worshiping by yourself, if you set your intentions on something and you're that immersed in those intentions, then you're going to have a euphoric experience. There's yeah. no doubt about it. So, and this is across the board. I mean, I could set my intentions on any God or any concept of a spiritual right. deity and still oh, have sure. the same euphoric experience. So they think that they're having this because somehow God has made it happen, right? His right. spirit descended upon them. Yeah. Being that's slain it. out. I mean, that's what we always called it when I was in church was being slain out. I just remember many times getting in a circle with people, grabbing hands and praying in the spirit, right? Sure. Yep. And you feel the heat. You feel the heat. Yep. But, and then you have to say, well, what is that? And people, they don't want to accept that it was something as simple as energy being directed to a certain intention. Right. I was a teenager and I was up front praying, you know, mind my own business. I was going through some stuff and was just praying to myself, you know, might've been like a special revival service or something. And I remember the preacher coming, coming down as a laying his hand on my head, very common in the movement I came from, you know, and he's yelling and man, did his breath stink. He had horrible BO and he's got a hold of my head and he's like shaking me, you know, got to the point And he was, and, uh, he was like slaying people out, you know, and I think he was expecting the same thing to happen to me. I opened my eyes and put my hands down and just walked away. And he looked so offended, you know, and like just totally blown away. And, um, you know, I said to my family later, I was like, you know, he smelled horrible. I couldn't focus on anything because he's shaking me around. I'm like, this can't. I'm probably only like 15, 16 at the time, maybe probably like 16. And I'm saying to my grandmother and my mom, I'm like, this can't be like in order with the will of God. You know, if I'm up there have trying to have a personal, I guess you say conversation or some type of breakthrough experience because I'm going through some stuff, you know? And this fat guy with high blood pressure comes down and just starts shaking me around. Like how, how is that benefiting me? You know? And, I don't want to say that started giving me doubts, but it definitely put a bad taste in my mouth in that type of showboat Christianity. You know, mind you, I stayed in the movement for another 10 years, but, but still it was just one of those things like read the room, dude. <laughs> you know, there's all these other people jumping around wishing you'd have your, their hands on your hands on them, you know, but, uh, and I'm the one you come for. So it was just one of those things, especially when he was expecting this to happen, like, the whoosh with Benny Hinn, you know, he's expecting me to fall down and it just didn't happen. Well, I've seen pastors pray in tongues to the point where they keep you there for two, three hours because they're waiting for somebody to interpret what they're saying. It's like, dude, give it up. You know, let us go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but it is, it is showboating. Mm. Well, I wanted to ask you something because I, when you were first telling your backstory, I was really moved when you said that you were broken from this experience. And I, I wanted to talk about that because I know a lot of people are, they're fearful of leaving this comfort zone that they've been in for so long and not to mention being rejected or cast aside by their friends and family. And if you could just share with us what you went through psychologically and emotionally and how you were able to sort of climb out of that dark night of the soul. Yeah, it wasn't. Of course, I lost friends in the. One thing I always I always say that's kind of funny is my parents and my grandparents. Well, I'm, sh I'm sure my grandparents aren't happy about it, but they don't argue with me. They don't shun me or anything like that, because even when I was. You know, a Christian, my my biblical literacy was just leaps and bounds ahead, you know, so they just would never bother arguing with me about anything, especially now. So it's one thing I have going for me is they don't, they don't try to beat me over the head with the Bible because they know I just, <laughs> you know, I'll just flip it around. But what I can say is I did lose some friends. Of course, people just 
when you're out of the in group, then you're out. You know, you're you're not good enough anymore. But really, none of that bothers me. Actually, I think I'm much happier not having any of those fake friends than I was. You know, that part of it, the community part of it, never bothered me. Not having that no, didn't bother me one bit. What bothered me was one, I was mad at myself because I taught this stuff. And I feel like I might have ruined lives, too, because I fed them this same stuff. Um, and shout out to Rabbi Federo, because he really got me through that. And you know, he's he's such a he's such a great advisor, you know, and such a great. I guess empath, you know, he was very good at. Um, talking me through, like in your mind at the time, this was true. You only were trying to help these people. And you can't hold this shame. And I honestly can say he he got me through a lot of these dark moments where I had that leftover shame that Christianity just like paints onto you, you know, like the total depraved, I'm trash, you know, how can I ever forgive myself? And he really, he really helped me get through that and wash my mind of that Christian mindset. But in regards to me being broken, yeah, I, I mean, I was, I, I, I felt lied to, you know, it was, I felt like, I felt like I had a relationship with someone for my entire life just to find out that it was an affair. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, that's really what it felt like. And people I looked up to and people I thought were, you know, such holy people of God, you know, and I'm sure this wasn't their intention because I'm sure they just didn't know any better, but I felt like they were lying to me. I just felt so lied to, you know, I felt deceived for 20 plus years and I was even more angry with myself that I didn't see it sooner. You know, that's probably the part that I wrestled with the most is how did I not see this sooner? Like, why did, why did it take until now for me to notice? And I think it comes down to, you know, you're just so enamored with the experience, the euphoria, being active and the fact that 2 billion Christians are in the world, how could it be wrong? But what it really took was I just withdrew into myself. I withdrew into my studies and I withdrew into different lectures. You know, Rabbi Singer, Or Sameach, Rabbi Skobak, Tanakh Talk, um, Rabbi Breidowitz, just so many different avenues. And I just took, starting to get hard to remember how long ago this was now. Um so it's been whew, quite a few years. I'd say it was probably a solid, solid two years. I didn't, I didn't talk with anyone about religion. I didn't do anything like that. What I did was I just studied. I withdrew in myself and studied and took that time to just wash my mind of Christianity till the point that I got to a point as if Christianity didn't exist. And that's really what I think a Christian needs to do if they're, having these problems and they're leaving, they're on their exodus, as it were, if they're on their way out and finding these Torah teachings, don't study Torah to debunk Christianity. Don't study Torah in spite of Christianity. Study Torah as if Christianity just doesn't even exist, you know, because that's how you find truth. Truth isn't spiteful. Truth is just truth. And I was, I was on a mission to get to the truth. I didn't care what avenue I had to take to get there. And I didn't care, like, if it came from a guy with a kippa and a long white beard or whomever, you know. All I know is I wanted the truth. And I found that in Judaism. Um, and, that's, and that's really what allowed me. And honestly, calling out Rabbi Federer again, being put into the mindset of I'm not good and I'm not evil, I'm neutral. And my decisions are what are going to make me righteous or unrighteous. That gave me a self-esteem I never had before. It gave me a motivation to be better. It helped my business probably tenfold. It, it just gave me a drive, you know? And when, when I really started studying the life of Avram, of, uh, Avram, yeah, I was like, I need to do something. I can't keep this in anymore. You know, I still feel like I have a message to spread with the world. Even though I got a calling to the ministry at 14, I still feel like I have a message for people. 
And I started Exodus Project. It was after a probably solid two year, nothing but study period. I mean, no teaching, no engaging in comments, no engaging in anything like that. It was simply just two years of nothing but study. And that's that's when I finally felt ready to open my mouth about it. Yeah, well, what you're doing is incredible. And I see that it just took off really quickly, which I feel, you know, it's blessed by God when it does that. Is there a way that people can get in touch with you other than your channel? Is there a website or a email address or? Uh, Yeah. I mean, Steve Eisenhower on Facebook, if you want to reach out to me there, that's fine. Or um, rediscoveringgod22 at gmail.com is the email for the channel. You know, I don't think that (laughs) there's enough hours of the day for us to sit here and talk about everything. (laughs) Sure. This is concerned. And I definitely would love to have you on. And I was on your show last week and that was a blast. We had so much fun. Yeah, it was awesome. And we just, I think between the two of us, we have a lot of stories to share (laughs) about what we've been through. Yeah, definitely. It is an encouragement to other people. So, but I do want to commend you for what you've done thus far. And I know what you're going to be doing in the future. And of course, thank you for coming on to my program today. And of course, of course, anytime, anytime.